subsurface environment. In previous lectures, we outlined the idea of monitored natural attenuation and the four processes that we had to consider in that remedial technology, advection, dispersion, uh, retardation, and reaction. Uh, we've had some examples of advection and how uh, poor monitoring might lead to some bad interpretations. And this lecture, we want to move on to the second process, dispersion. So dispersion is a process that is good in that it bring about, brings about dilution. It's perhaps also hazardous in that it brings about a little bit faster movement of a small amount of the contaminants. We're aware of dispersion if we look at uh, the smoke plumes that come out of chimneys. Uh, near the chimney, the smoke is very intense. As the plume moves away, it becomes less and less intense. The uh, nature of the smoke breaks up into uh, smaller packages, and eventually it disappears. That's the process of dispersion. What you note about these plumes as well is that dispersion seems to be only in the direction of flow. That is, the, the plume of smoke doesn't get much wider as it moves along. So that tells us something about dispersion in that in the direction of flow, it's serious, it's a significant process, but transverse to flow, in fact, it may not be as important as we might hope. The difficulty is that in porous media, dispersion is actually weaker than it is in air. In air, we have turbulent flow, so the mixing of contaminated air with clean air is faster. In groundwater, the porous media inhibits this. So for us, dispersion is a fairly weak process, but still we should consider it. We often show dispersion in a cartoon like this, where if we have steady groundwater flow, we suggest that the plume will go wider, and at the front end of the plume, we'll have some dispersion. And that's illustrated in the next slide, which plots the concentration versus distance along the center of that plume. Um, if the concentration at the source is steady, and it has a value of C0, uh, instead of that concentration going along to the front of the plume it, and falling off, it goes along until we get near the front of the plume, and then it actually goes down and continues a little bit further. That is the dispersed front of the plume. That's the effect of longitudinal dispersion. It brings about lower concentrations uh, in, in the front of the plume, but also moves some of that mass a little bit faster along the groundwater flow. Uh, there have been scientific studies uh, to estimate dispersion, and an interesting factor was noted that as the scale of the study increases, perhaps from small laboratory scale studies all the way up to some of the largest plumes of contamination we've seen, the value for dispersion seems to increase. Now, in theory, the, this dispersion factor should be constant. What this increase is really showing us is that as we encounter more heterogeneities in the material, uh, we get more dispersion. So, in our point of view, uh, dispersion is mainly due to the increased number of heterogeneities. The more heterogeneities, the more dispersion you will have. So, it's very difficult to estimate what dispersion will be beforehand, but if you're aware of it, you can help interpret some of your monitoring by knowing that it, it's bound to occur to some extent. Well, what difference does dispersion make in monitored natural attenuation? Well, two things could happen. Uh, it could actually help us in our monitoring uh, by helping us understand when the plume is steady, that is, when it's not advancing. And it clearly provides some dilution or some decrease in concentration. Is it that significant? Well, let's deal with the first issue, the idea that um, if we can monitor within the existing plume uh, and the concentration at that monitoring point becomes steady, does that mean the plume is no longer advancing? It'd be very handy because at most sites we have good monitoring within the plume, but monitoring in front of the plume is more difficult if it was sufficient simply to monitor what's in the plume um, and then know that the front of the plume is no longer moving, that would be a big benefit. 
Here's an example, um, a, a really a modeling study, but it's based on the aquifer properties of Borden again. If we have a constant source and a, a steady flow in a uniform homogeneous aquifer, uh, this is what dispersion might do for us. Um, as the plume moves along, it reaches time one, and you can see the concentration along the center of the plume has a curve that goes down fairly quickly. Um, at time two, the plume extends further, but again the front is dispersed. Time three, the same picture. Time four, the same picture. Uh, the question is, if we were monitoring uh, at the point indicated as one, when it is steady, is the plume front not moving? Well, you can see that any time after time two, the concentration at point one is in fact steady. But you notice that the plume is advancing. It hasn't stopped. At time two, it's moved further. At time three, time four, it's moved further each time. While it's been steady at the monitoring well, we may have at point one. So, steady concentration in the plume is no indication that the front of the plume is steady or not. Again, if we do that modeling, and if the modeling is reasonable, uh, we can get an estimate of the dilution that might occur due to dispersion alone, or advection and dispersion. And again, this is based on Borden sand, a nice homogeneous sand. And you can see that the concentrations drop from the input concentration of the source to something like 20% of that concentration in four or 500 meters. So that's a considerable dilution. The concentrations are 20% of what they were near the source. Is that enough? Well, for many contaminants it might be, but not for the organic contaminants we're emphasizing in this course. The problem is the organic contaminants have extremely low drinking water standards or environmental standards relative to the concentrations that we'll encounter near the source. For example, a benzene standard is typically five micrograms per liter, and concentrations near the source of gasoline spills are often five milligrams per liter. To meet the drinking water standard, we would have to see dilution of a thousand, at least. And here we're showing you that we should anticipate dilution of uh, uh, 10 percent, 80 percent, not dilutions of 99.99 percent. So dispersion is helpful, it brings about lower concentration, but it's unlikely to meet remedial objectives. The other aspect about dispersion that we should know affects how we monitor. Here's a very good example of, of what is likely close to reality. If we look at a a control plane, that is a plane perpendicular to groundwater flow near the source. And if we assumed that control plane had uniform concentrations, everywhere within that area, the same concentration, and we simply invected and dispersed that plume, it would grow laterally by a little bit, but rather than now being a uniform uh, piece of contamination, over a, a, a larger area, that is going from a control plane of this size to a control plane of that size, uh, what actually happens is this control plane now of contamination has the contamination localized within the plane. So we've gone from a uniform uh, control plane distribution, which would be easy to monitor, to now a very distributed uh, concentration distribution, which is hard to monitor. Uh, on the diagram, we put a number of points which you might be monitoring, and you can see that sometimes you hit a large contamination, other times you miss it entirely. So, what this is telling us is that the process of dispersion not only brings about lower concentrations, but it actually brings about a, a more heterogeneous plume, which is more difficult to monitor. So if hydrogeologists are aware of that problem, they'll, they'll do a better job of monitoring. And again, the same group of people have done a nice job of showing us the complexities of plumes uh, that we should expect. 
Uh, on the left is a, a graph of the result of the testing of permeability in a core in this Borden sand. And again, the sand is viewed by hydrogeologists as fairly uniform. And you can see the value of hydraulic conductivity taken at very small segments continuously down the core um, varies considerably by an order of magnitude. In most other uh, aquifers, the variation is well, well beyond that, many orders of magnitude in most cases. But Borden is fairly uniform. So if you use a mathematical model to predict how contaminants would move through um, an aquifer uh, represented by that core, that is the groundwater moving horizontally through that core, carrying conservative chemicals, that is ones that don't, don't undergo retardation or reaction, uh, the diagram on the right shows you the distribution of those chemicals after some time. If we were to sample that aquifer with a well that sampled the whole aquifer all at once, we call that a long screened monitoring well, we would get some average concentration of the water at those different depths. And we, would as we could assume then that the concentrations were reasonably low and uniform. Well, you can see from the diagram that the concentrations aren't uniform. In many areas along the dotted well screen, the concentrations are non-existent. In other areas, they're very high. They're about equivalent to what they were at the source. So if we monitor with a fully screened well, we might be misled into thinking the concentrations are low and uniform, when in fact we should know that the concentrations are not uniform, and there are at least a few areas where the concentrations are quite high. And that should really direct our conceptual models to consider that case. So this is induction and dispersion alone producing this complexity. If we were to again install fully screened wells along that particular plume, we might see a very smooth decline in concentrations as we move away from the source. And we might be uh, interpreting this as a very uniform aquifer with a nice smooth dispersed front. When in fact, when we look at the data, if we were sampling with very detailed multiple uh, sampling points at each well, we would see the complexity that really exists. Now it's very unlikely uh, you in the real world will get a chance to drill as many points as it will take to see the complexity. Uh, but when you uh, are required to use the long screen wells, make sure your interpretation is consistent with the likely complexity that's there that your well simply won't be able to inform you. Real plumes are also irregular. Here's an example of a plume from a base in uh, California. Uh, you can see that there's a high concentration core um, that is very high concentration and lower concentrations around. And as you get to the margins of that plume, the concentrations become very sporadic. Uh, and you would only know the plume has that particular distribution if you had a lot of monitoring points. If you don't have that monitoring point, you may assume that the concentrations are more uniform and on average lower, and you would be wrong. In the case we're showing here, that was an important issue. Because we were using a permeable reactive barrier to treat the contaminants, it was designed to treat 60 milligrams per liter of contaminant in the core of the plume you can see we have concentrations of 200 milligrams per liter, and our system simply couldn't treat that area. So in a small area of our treatment zone, those concentrations actually broke through. And if it had been anything other than a research project, it would have been considered a failure of the remedial system. So again, the distribution of contaminants as it's affected by infection, and particularly by dispersion, is important to anticipate as you do your monitoring for monitoring natural attenuation.